Welcome to Heaven Awaits. If this is your first time checking this channel out, I'm glad to have you here. My name is Lee and I narrate the near-death experiences of those who have died and have seen the other side. These videos are meant to bring hope to a sometimes hopeless world and show people that there is life after death. If you enjoy these videos, please consider hitting the thumbs up, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified of new content. Doing so is free and it does help the channel grow. To my returning viewers, I'm glad to have you back. This was one of the first videos that I ever did on Heaven Awaits, and is sadly one of the ones that needed to have the name removed. I will post a link to where you can find his experience. I don't want to spoil it, so get comfortable, grab a cup of coffee or tea, and let's dive into today's narration. In January 1998, I endured a workplace accident involving my shoulder. Over the course of a few years, I endured multiple procedures to restore function. Unfortunately, after being prescribed oxycoset, I developed a mental need for this medication but still required it for physical needs and I still need pain meds to this day. It was during this transition that I decided to stop asking for refills because of the stigma. The stigma of appearing to be a drug seeker. When dealing with chronic pain, people are often perceived as drug addicts only, not as a person struggling through chronic and debilitating pain. Therefore, I decided to begin using and abusing an over-the-counter pain med known as Tylenol-1 generic version. This medicine consists of 3 25 mg of acetaminophen, 8 mg of codeine, and 15 mg of caffeine. At this point, I truly could not care less about the impact that could be taking place on my liver and other vital organs. I just wanted to survive and not hate every waking moment of my life. Chronic pain can have a devastating effect on your life force, literally to the point where you begin to stop caring about life any longer. My daily dosage consisted of 40 pills in the morning and 40 at night consistently. Often there would be a smattering of a few here and there throughout the day as well. Certainly some people may think that I was enjoying a high while taking these pills, but that was never the case. I wasn't chasing a buzz when I would take them. After each of my dosages, it wouldn't take long before I could sense the 13,000 milligrams of acetaminophen in my system. I was able to taste this drug with every breath. It is a foul taste. We are all well aware of this nastiness. Slight nausea wasn't long to follow. It really shouldn't be all that surprising to anyone that I was willing to tolerate these effects. People will drink alcohol only to suffer from a hangover. Smokers and the disgusting smell. Many examples can be given. It's not hard to imagine that it became necessary to shop around when buying such large quantities of these pills, even though they are over the counter. Questions are still asked. Often I would buy a bottle of 200 at one store and then go elsewhere to gain another 200 from another location. The idea was that for four and a half to five days, I didn't have to worry about getting more. I do realize that this sounds like a ridiculous amount of pills, but this is the amount to which I had escalated. These pills, all they would do is barely knock the edge off of the pain and dull it down for me a little. While in this ritual of eating 80 or more pills a day, a pharmacist would accidentally give me the aspirin version. They are virtually the same thing except it has 325 milligrams of aspirin as opposed to acetaminophen. My body had only acclimated to the extreme level of acetaminophen and not aspirin. The fact that I had not noticed I was given the wrong pill type is what was going to kill me only days later. The stupid chain of events that transpired after ingesting my first 40 pill dose of the aspirin version was incredible. Only moments before I was listening to my MP3 player at far too high a volume. So when my ears began to ring from the aspirin, I blamed myself for not listening to my music at a more reasonable volume. This ringing happened all night. As morning approached, I began to feel flu-like symptoms. This too was from the excessive amount of aspirin. I was so ill with what I thought was the flu, I decided to take a sick day from work to feel better. Unfortunately, that was not to come to fruition. Simply because with the morning comes another 40 pills, and of course, I was getting sicker and sicker. 40 more pills for the night. Then another sick day with only about another 20 or so pills in the morning and the same for the night of my second sick day. I was taking less only because I was feeling nauseated and struggled to keep them down. At this point, I was extremely sick. I was dying. During this time, I was on my own. 
I had to try and care for myself since my wife and I lived at different addresses. The two of us had separated on May 1st of 2004 and had only been in the process of reconciliation a short time. When my wife got to my home that evening, she convinced me I needed to go to a walk-in clinic to see a doctor. My condition had deteriorated to the point where I could barely hear. The ringing in my ears was so loud and it felt as though I was underwater. I could barely stand. I was so dizzy. I was on the constant verge of vomiting and my breathing was a struggle. The doctor felt I just had a really bad dose of the flu and prescribed me some antibiotics to help, but I was going downhill very, very fast. You see, my little daily regimen of taking massive amounts of pills was my little secret. I would be seen taking some, but the true amount was never known to anyone but myself. I became good at swallowing them, so good at it that I could dump the 40 pills into my hand and with a drink swallow them all down at once. No problem at all. Anyway, because I was so sick, I had begun taking fewer pills to keep them down and not throw up. The morning of my third sick day, life was leaving me. My ears were ringing and I could barely hear. My muscles and joints were aching and my breathing was more and more labored. When my wife got to my home that evening, I had no idea what or who I was from one moment to the next. There would be intervals of cognition only to be followed up by unawareness. I remember swallowing the rest of the pills just before my wife's arrival. My wife could see how dire my situation was and forcefully urged me to go see a doctor. I was brought to the emergency room of our local hospital and all the while still keeping my secret regarding the pills. The triage nurse wasn't informed of the overdose of aspirin. Now, at this point, I do remember arriving at the hospital. My wife had taken me to Hotel Dieu Hospital. Oftentimes, this hospital is far less busy and wait times are much shorter. Once the nurse in triage saw me and checked some of my vitals, I was admitted to the hospital right away. The hospital that first admitted me decided to transfer me to the main hospital of Kingston called Kingston General Hospital. It is far better suited to deal with any emergency. I remember being transported via ambulance. I was moved from the bed to the gurney and loaded into the back of the ambulance. During transport, my IV was ripped out because I had caught the hose on something. When this happened, I bled far more than is normal. My blood was so thin from the aspirin and it didn't want to clot. Once arriving at KGH, I was immediately placed under the constant supervision of a nurse. My breathing had become so labored that I felt it was the fault of the oxygen mask I had on. So, despite being restrained, I managed to remove the O2 mask, only to get it immediately placed back on by my nurse. I wasn't thinking clearly. I remember she wasn't very pleased with me. Every time I was able to remove the mask, she would have to come in and place it back on. No doubt her frustration was building due to the many times I was successful. The bed I was in had a window where a nurse can maintain constant supervision. Multiple times she would bang on the window and express her annoyance with my efforts. This battle between her and I raged on for quite some time. The situation for me was becoming more and more desperate, and I knew it. Many times I requested to see a doctor, and this request seemed to fall on deaf ears. I knew I was in a dire situation and I didn't have much more time. Only seconds after the doctor's arrival I told him, Tell my wife and kids that I love them. It was extremely important to me to utter those words. All the while during my battle with the nurse, I could feel my decline and I knew time was running out for me. I was continually requesting a doctor, but unbeknownst to me, my case was being discussed in another room, across the hall. At the end of reciting what I felt were extremely important and precious words, I died. This is when it happened. My near-death experience. I felt it. The moment I was able to get those words of love out of my mouth, a peace came over me. After struggling for days, it was as if a switch had been flipped. Initially, I could hear the commotion from the doctors and nurses in full fervor of trying to save my life. Dedicated and intelligent professionals sworn to the provision of healing and comfort to those in need. These professionals swear an oath and hold it dear as they serve the public. This desperate noise declined to no sound at all. I went from a very, very well-lit emergency room bay to darkness gradually taking hold. The colors in my vision went from vibrant to muted, then darker, darker, and black. There was a sensation of heaviness in my chest as I fought for every breath while pressed upon with chest compressions to an incredible floating feeling. We have all felt this feeling at one point or another. 
It's that stomach-dropping sensation as we meet the crest of a roller coaster peak and race downward, or on the return sway of a swing going high. There are many, many examples of that stomach drop and weightlessness feeling. I knew it. I knew I was leaving my body. I instantly felt better. The suffering of the last few days was gone. I was able to breathe without struggle and my hearing had been restored to normal. No longer did I have a nauseating feeling that had been there for days. Again, it was as if a switch had been thrown, an instantaneous change in what my senses had been telling me. Unfortunately, this calm was not going to last. The weightlessness, the floating feeling, and most importantly, the peace. The peace I had been enjoying for the last few seconds was about to be ripped from me, like yanking a cane out from under an elderly person that cannot walk without it or a rope torn from your hands. Imagine the near silence and serenity of night to suddenly hearing the shriek of a high-pitched scream. It is shocking and instantly unsettling to one's being. It happened. It was my destination. The arrival after my short and desperate trip. Like the pull of a magnet and the snapping into place. I was there. The sentence I had unwittingly bestowed myself. An evaluation had taken place and a decision had been made. The evaluation occurred and I had no awareness of it. There was no presentation of guilt or innocence. Evidence was not provided as proof of guilt. You can't take the stand to dispute accusations against you. I was not allowed to sway my eternity in the direction of my choice. You are either deserving of heaven or you are not. There are lost souls out there in the world that are serving the devil and his causes. These minions of evil will find themselves wishing. They will be wishing for the hands of time to be turned back and allowed to correct their horrible ways. Hell is real. It is a place where all negativity endures. A never-ending cycle of the worst your imagination can deliver. If spiders are your worst fear, then be prepared for an eternity of them, crawling on you, biting you, and perhaps even burrowing into your skin. This will happen, minute by minute, hour by hour, to never stop. My first awareness upon arrival was visual. As I was creeping out of total darkness, I was brought a blur of the color red, then sharpening and increasing shades of red. Second by second, I was able to distinguish items and things, but they were of varying shades of red. I was to find myself standing atop a catwalk in a post-apocalyptic world displayed in the color red, decay and filth in all directions. Anywhere I would look, the images were moving. The movement was very similar when we look at objects in a distance past the heat coming off a very hot surface such as a paved road. There was no threshold to cross to separate myself from this disturbing place. I saw absolutely no signs of life on any scale. There were no trees or bushes. I couldn't see any birds flying or animals scurrying about the landscape. It was a dead world as far as I could see or tell. Life had once been here but had long gone away. There were remnants of trees. Buildings that once housed people had become broken down and destroyed, similar to a post-war city. Then, I was given the sensation of sound. Slowly it went from low and muted to loud and vibrating. I did not hear birds singing, friends laughing or babies giggling. I heard the lamenting sounds of anguish, cries of torment, and screams of pain. It was constant, close, far away, and all around me. Never again was I to know tranquility and equanimity. I don't know how I knew, but I did. I wasn't arriving at a particular horrifying point of arrival in hell. I had an escape check-in of hell's busy time. It was all the time. A never-ending sound coupled with an only red world and I was alone. Do you see? I could hear others but saw none. Isolation has a lasting effect on you. I was to face what was to come solely on my own. There was no support to be found from others. Others who will share what will be imposed. Solace has no place here. The comfort from others would be a strike against one of Satan's commandments. The atmosphere was oppressive, as though the air itself was of a laborious weight pushing down and crushing. The smell in this wasteland was disgusting to say the least. It smelled of death like a rotting animal, musty like a basement in an old home, and sewage. It was causing me to want to vomit and there was no escape from it anywhere. It was hot and it was suffocating. The rush of heat that I felt is difficult to express maybe similar to when you opened an over door, except it was all over my body. I saw no relief in sight. There were no bodies of water such as lakes or ponds to offer a reprieve. The feeling was that as my thirst began to rise because of this hell, that thirst will never be quenched. 
it was only to become worse and more agonizing. As I began to walk along this catwalk, I was in search of others, but simultaneously, I was in fear of who or what I may find. Those other souls could be heard, but none could be seen. This is Satan's depiction of heaven's pearly gates. The difference is that atop this catwalk with an aerial view of my new never-ending home, I am to spend eternity wanting for all things, in constant pursuit to reverse my deteriorating condition forever and ever. All that I hold dear and had taken for granted shall never be sourced. Imagine all the things you like, family, friends, people, music, animals, and so on and so on. Whatever you would miss intentionally is not there. It will cause your soul to yearn and weep for your losses. Desperation for the unattainable. I continued along that catwalk slowly and laboriously. Little by little, I was reaching the end. Each step felt as if trudging through a muddy field. I thought it was going to be my way down and the beginning of my self-determined destiny. The path I followed in life was not good enough. As I reached the end, I was greeted. Greeted with what was to become my welcome. Below me were monsters. They were horrifying beasts, unlike anything I knew to be real in life. Creations born from hell. They were giant worm-like creatures, a chimera of fiendish traits. Inside a wide open mouth, large enough for me to be swallowed whole, I saw menacing teeth. Giant pointed teeth, contorted in all directions and gnashing with anticipation of my arrival. These beasts were wriggling around with claw-adorned legs, competing for their prize. I was that prize. Countless eyes could be seen, clearly focused on me. A cat's eye pupil, and as I gazed into these eyes, I sensed intelligence. They weren't mindless. They were aware, very aware. It was as though they were feeding on my fear. I wasn't able to resist. I couldn't stop from taking another step. My independent will had been stripped from me. My mind was saying no, but my body marched on. Those last few steps, onward to the edge and with only a brief moment in time, there was a pause. A fleeting moment. It lasted only long enough so that I could become aware of it. It lasted long enough for me to believe I had gained control again. Control of my legs and feet, and perhaps the rest of my body. It didn't last, though. That fleeting moment came and passed, and with it went my plunge from the edge. A descent into the mass of writhing and gnawing monsters, coiled and covered in mucus. A chaotic mass clearly of the devil's creation. My plummet was swift, and the landing was hard and unmoving. Scrambling to escape was not an option. There is no retreat to safety in this place. Like being pulled from below, I slowly disappeared into them. My awareness was suspended in fear and despair. Sinking, I digested my latest experience and contemplated what might be yet to come, all while drifting into darkness. I never made it out or escaped from that mass of wicked and ravenous abominations. Once the darkness enveloped me, it was over. Thankfully, there was no repeat of the horrible chain of events I had just gone through. This wasn't to be my hell on a never-ending cycle of snapping into place, finding myself atop that catwalk being drawn towards the end and plummeting into beasts. I am so thankful I only had to endure this once. This single experience has had an everlasting effect on my psyche. I had been placed in an induced coma to better control my recovery. After all, in previous days there had been another battle. My body was determined to die, but the doctors and nurses fought against it. Three times that fight occurred, and three times it was the doctors and nurses to claim victory. I was to remain in this condition for a few days. I now had a machine breathing for me. Blood dialysis had rid my body of all the aspirin, and I had been given potassium. My condition was grim at best during my first couple of days of intensive care. My wife had been informed that the likelihood of me surviving was very minimal. The doctor felt that it would be best that my immediate family be told and offered the ability to say goodbye. Although I had died three different times and been brought back, the doctor truly felt I wasn't going to make it out of the hospital alive. My body had been starved of oxygen for days. The organs were shutting down and it was unclear as to the damage I had done to myself. The next thing I knew, I was being awakened in a dimly lit hospital room with other patients and nurses. I was in the intensive care unit. I had been intubated, had multiple IVs, monitors, and what looked like a garden hose going into the femoral artery on the inside of my right leg. And yes, a catheter had been placed in me too. It is a very peculiar feeling to have a tube down your throat and have a machine breathing for you.
As it turns out, I had 4.5 times the lethal dose of aspirin in my system. My blood had become so thinned out. When I was drawing in oxygen and processing it, fluid was leaking out and into my lungs. I had been drowning little by little for a few days. This accounts for the struggle in my breathing. The dehydration in the previous days had depleted my potassium level to dangerously low. In the coming days, I progressively was getting better. I would be moved to a step-down unit where I no longer required 24-7 supervision by my nurse. I had been moved to a double occupancy room. I was still being closely monitored except my nurse was no longer sitting at a desk at the foot of my bed. My quality of care never diminished. I just required less supervision. Once my catheter and the tube in my femoral artery were removed, I was to be transferred again. I was sent to yet another step-down unit, where I would spend another few days wearing an oxygen hose under my nose. I am very fortunate to have such a loving family. I was visited every day and comforted by their appreciation of me. However, I had been traumatized by my near-death experience. I wasn't sleeping well. I had told my mom and dad about my experience, but I don't think they knew how to take it. Both of my parents are Christians and had been churchgoers most of their life as had I. The last four days I would spend many, many hours trying to understand why I was delivered to the devil. It was certainly a harrowing eleven days that I put my family through, but come that eleventh day, I was able to walk out on my own. That does it for today's experience. As stated in today's earlier video, I am redoing my older videos and removing the names. If you wish to read about this man's experience, see the link in the pinned comment. I would like to point out I did make some minor changes to this experience to fix the sentence flow. Anyway, let me know what you all thought in the comment section below. Until the next video, stay safe and continue to be blessed. Time to thank those who were kind enough to donate to the channel via super thanks or by buying me a coffee. Let's get to it. Roy Openshaw, Anthony Aird, Joni Golbronson, Mary Beth, Robin, Someone, Ansam Alpha, and Linda. Thank you all for your kindness and generosity. And to donors and non-donors alike, thank you all for continuing to watch these videos. With that out of the way, let's all wish Linda a very special happy birthday.